Dadhood. Modern Dadhood Podcast. <laughs> well, we're here. We are, man. You've had you've had a night so far. You've had an entire night already. I've kept you waiting for a long time to get into this this session. No, it gave me an opportunity to catch up on about 11 years of Vine videos that I hadn't seen. So thank you, actually. Vine. Thank you for the I opportunity. Love Vine and I miss Vine yeah. a lot. <clears throat> Did you say introduce the show? Yeah, I want to. Yeah, I can do that. <clears throat> I drew a blank. Do we usually say... Oh, I got it. I got it. I got it. <laughs> Folks, <laughs> welcome back. This is Modern Dadhood, an ongoing conversation about the joys, the challenges, and the general insanity of being a dad in this moment. My name is Mark Checkett, and I am a dad to twin boy toddlers. And my name's Adam Flaherty, and I'm a dad to two daughters who are seven and four years old. Before we get started, I just thought I would ask this question. How many rocks do you think I pull out of my washing machine every day? There's a specific number, and it's always the same? Are you asking for me to... I've asked the question. Hmm. I'm going to say that... I think both boys mm -hmm. have a thing where they each want to have three rocks in each pocket. Ooh. So mm -hmm. we're going three, six, nine, twelve. You're close. Um, it's actually all of the rocks. That's the answer. All of the rocks in New Hampshire or just or all? At least all of the rocks. At least all of the rocks at daycare. They're taking them home and they're putting them through the laundry. We wash them thoroughly, and then I, I put them in the trash. I don't know what else to do with them. <laughs> yeah, it's a daily thing. I don't know. Do your uh, your kids bring rocks home from places? Sometimes it's rocks, but I would say more often it's like sticks. Oh, really? The back of my car ah. will have just random, long, gangly, you know, sticks that have some meaning to one of the girls. But I, 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 could, I could see at least a stick being repurposed, you know, as a, as a walking aid, you know, the, the next time you go for a hike or something. But the rocks in the pockets, I'm getting a little tired of it. I would yeah. be done with that instantly, too. Hey, remember that time that we talked to Ben Lee? Do I? I'm still reeling. Genuinely love that dude. Yeah, 100%. I would love to... Here's what I'd really love, and it probably will never happen. I'd love to just, like, sit down and have a couple cups of coffee and just shoot the shit for a little while with him. Because I, 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 what will happen is what exactly happened in our interview will go in one direction, and then he'll, he'll find a side road and take us down this windy path. And I'll talk about stuff I had uh, not previously thought I would talk about. And we're totally unprepared for. And we're totally too. unprepared for. Yeah, hundred <laughs> percent unprepared for. And it, it, I, I should I should say it was mostly Ben that covered the ground. He's just such a, an intelligent and interesting, creative, honest uh, person. What's fascinating to me about about him, among other things is he has this this breadth of knowledge, but it seems to be just right there available to him at, at any given moment. And that's what makes him such an interesting person to listen to when you just give him something and let him go with it. Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. that's what made uh, that short lived podcast that Max Quinn mm -hmm. uh, was created and hosted Ben Lee in quarantine because you give him a topic or you put, you put something out there in the conversation and he's got something to say about it, but he's also going to take it. He's going to take you on this journey and he's going to mention for a guy of his level of like introspection and thought. And he's, he can take the conversation into so many directions and go very far with it. Um, and it's wonderful to listen to. I got into his art through his music a bunch of years ago, and it's been really great to see his career evolve as he's come along, too. But 
I think he's one of those rare musical artists that can write something that is just pure pop music, a joy to listen to. It feels carefree, but there's actually a lot of depth there, too. It's pretty masterfully crafted music. All right, now that we've gushed for 10 minutes about how incredible Ben Lee is, why don't we return to our conversation with him? So where we left off in our conversation with Ben in the last episode is Ben uh, had been interrupted by a, some texts and a phone call from his 19-year-old stepdaughter, Kate, who's in a bit of a jam. Is everything everything okay, Ben? I mean, it's funny how things like these grown-up tasks, they bring, uh, sometimes they bring anxiety, you know? Sorry, what were you talking about? Well, it's all relevant. This is all parenting we're doing in the midst of the That's podcast. Absolutely right. It doesn't say, end. Yeah, it no, doesn't if, end. If there's, if there's one thing that we would prefer to be interrupted, like w- in the middle of a session, is to go <laughs> and be a dad. I think it's great. I know. And you know what's interesting about it? That like I was trying to instill this lesson to her today because she's actually waiting to hear about a job. Mm. And she's got this uh, mentality of... I've, I can't do anything until I find out about the job, which I understand. Cause let me tell you in show business, you're always waiting to hear about a job. It never ends. But what I was saying to her today is there's a sort of universal law. It's like a weird cosmic law that when something's stuck, start moving the other things around it that you can move. If you freeze up in response to something being stuck, it'll stay stuck. Or it just takes a slow, whereas if you go, okay, I can get my Medicare, I can get the driver's license, I can, you set yourself up so that there's like development and progress is lubricated so that it's going, you know, it will slow, it has a weird way of slowly making everything else move. Um, So anyway, yeah. I've had a number of experiences lately that that feel similar to that, where something is just presented itself at at the right moment when I really needed it. And maybe it's just been awareness of a bit more being open and susceptible to that. But I, I, I don't know. I, I feel like it's it it kind of goes in line with what you're saying. Yeah, it's um oh man, it's so subtle. You know, like when I think of actually like the science of living and being happy and uh, or dealing with sadness and struggle creativity, the creation of a life. It is a very complex and delicate science. And when I look at the struggle that a kid has and then a teenager has, and I think about how um, how painful it is to be trying to make something happen and really to have very little understanding of which parts are in your control and which parts aren't and how helpless you feel in the face of that, I have a lot of empathy for that, you know, it's, um, but, but we do tend to figure it out and with enough years and enough success and failure. And part of that is we realize, we realize the parts we can't control. That's very true. That's very true. And, and, and it's the successes and failures and, and just the experience of having gone through it that informs your strategy going into that. You know, it's, it's, that's heavy stuff. Yeah, but you know, it's like everything is everything's everything, you know. It's like a it's a three-dimensional experience. Like like it's funny, you know, I'm like I'm just a, like slightly under the weather. I'm just kind of recovering from a bit of a cold I picked up on tour and um and I was talking to someone, I was like, "Oh, I'm going to go do a podcast." I was like, "I I'm incapable of phoning it in." Like I I have to show up and engage. So, I don't look at it as like deep necessarily. I just look at it as like an honest response to the moment that if I were to give anything less than um, a a truly spontaneous reaction, it would feel awful to me. Like I don't want to, it's more that I don't want to limit myself by capping an experience and saying like keeping it on the surface. So yeah, like all those things we would assume as being um, superficial or something. Like I can be in those spaces. I can be in the strip club. I can be at the cocktail party. I can, you know, uh, uh, I always say I can go uptown. I can go downtown. (laughs) 
you know, <laughs> but I'm going to be myself and bring my whole experience to that. So in the past couple of years, I feel like I've seen you share some content that's that I think is, you know, it's like a form of activism. And I don't I don't know if you yeah. necessarily call yourself an activist, but I feel like you are the type of person to sort of take a stand for what you believe in. Um, and I wonder what it's kind funny. Of- I, I never I just 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 on that. Yeah. Point, yeah. I, I never called it that. Mm. Until I heard other people call it that. Oh, interesting. And I went, oh, okay, I guess that's what I am. That's it's what like, I, am. I guess that's what it is. It's like, it's okay to call it something. Yeah. And if people say, uh, if people say that's activism, then yeah. that's activism. Well, it's funny. Yeah. We do have sort of an obsession with labeling things, don't we? Just, I guess, maybe as, as, like a, as people. I don't know. I feel like we have to call things something to better understand them. But what I, my question is, is I wonder what kind of conversations you have with your daughters around the responsibility of, of like making your voice heard. So there's the listening side of it, but then is there another side to that coin? Um, I tend not to, I mean, I tend not to try and be like, I guess not to lecture the kids about what they should do. Mm. I tend to think that it's, like your example is so much bigger than what you say. Like my parents were both involved in unions and, you know, just local politics. And I I, I just don't think it's possible if you grow up seeing that to not learn it and take it on and digest it and figure out how that fits into your life. It's not like, for instance, me applauding Colleen Ballinger and I got choked up when Goldie showed me that video there's the lesson in that that I'm not intentionally teaching, but it's coming through, is that in our family, we respect that. Mm-hmm. We respect people taking a stand for what's right, even at the risk of uh, disapproval. And I think it's all there in how you behave if you um, if your kids are watching closely, which they are. Yes, they are. <laughs> it certainly feels that way. Yeah. Sort of going back to the idea of uh, of being willing to discuss heavy topics, I feel like a lot of us as parents, at least I know that this is the case with me, can feel, I guess, overwhelmed by the idea of having big sort of philosophical conversations when it comes to our kids. So if I'm out throwing a Frisbee and drinking a beer with Mark, I have no problem talking about something like death or religion or, you know, human rights. But when it's my seven-year-old, I I guess I feel a responsibility to, to get it right. You know, I want to, um, like you said, inspire an open mind, inspire her to question everything. But I also want my kids to understand that I don't have all the answers. Do you feel that having conversations about philosophical things with your kids have the potential to, I guess, have a negative effect if you don't approach them with proper care and nuance? I'm sure they do. I mean, uh, what comes to mind, though, is that implicit within your question is the idea that the parent knows better. Hmm. And I'm not 100% convinced of that. Like, I feel... I feel like in terms of the science of effectiveness, often adults have learned through experience, like what works and what doesn't. So in that area, like, okay, so with my stepdaughter, she's having an anxiety attack about she can't remember where her car's parked when she's meant to be getting a Medicare card, right? So I said to her, Kate, don't worry about where your car's parked, get the Medicare card, Mm -hmm. right? So I'm telling her there's an act of prioritizing here. I promise you, your mind will be clear once you get the Medicare card and you'll find the car after. That's about effectiveness. In terms of emotional things or moral things, I don't believe in treating kids as if they don't know, you know? Like, like I think it, it's very, it happens much sooner than you think that your kids are teaching you. Mm. Much sooner. I, I remember a very specific example when Goldie was about four and we were, I was playing music in the car. I can't remember what we were, ta- how we got to it. And we started about talking about John Cage. 
and I described to her the piece of music he wrote where the the, the sheet music was blank hmm. and the experience was the sound of the room and that it was the shuffling in the seats and it was the musicians coughing and it was that was a piece of music. And I told her this and Goldie, her eyes started welling up with tears and she said, that's sad. Hmm. And I said, why? And she said, because the people came to hear beautiful music. And the compassion for the audience, which I realized cynicism had like beaten out of me Hmm. to the point that conceptual art, I was applauding it because of its sophistication of vision. And she was tapped into the innately emotional response of the audience. Um, She awoken me, uh, woke me up to that. Sorry, this is Kate again. What's it? Yeah. Catherine. I'm very lost. What? Okay. I Go seriously back to Medicare. love this. It's great. Man, how on the nose is this? It's just so perfect. Okay. Call me if you have any problems. <laughs> I love how, like, her tone is, like, resentful of me helping her. <laughs> this is, I, I can't believe we're, this is, we're living through this together. Okay. <laughs> you, you were a remarkably calm and composed. <laughs> It's all done, man. It feels like it's meant to be. Um, You know, it's like this is that, okay, that kind of thing does not imply I have any moral superiority to my daughter. It just implies I know how to get shit done better than a 19-year-old does. That's all it is. (laughs) Yep, yep. I I wanted to talk a little bit about the album Ben Lee sings songs about Islam for the whole family. Yeah. Because uh, the, there was an article that, that Adam and I were sharing that um, we reread. It was, it was supposed to be part of a larger project um, or, or with some other albums about some other religions as well. But you went forward with this one and released it because you felt like it was the right time. And I think that's a very interesting I don't know. I, I don't know. I call it a trait or, or what, but that you're able to be so in tune with what's happening while simultaneously sort of clear headed and disciplined enough to sit down and get to work in a moment like that. Uh, I reckon it, that it, it's sort of dawning on me, you know, close to 30 years into my career that that is possibly one of my greatest strengths um, because there is a mixture in life in the importance of strategy and the importance of spontaneously rethinking strategy. Mm -hmm. And to be successful at anything, you have to do both. You know, it's a good, like, (laughs) I actually think like a really good lesson on this is watching something like Shark Tank or something where you see like people who have these plans Mm -hmm. and some of them are great plans on paper, but they just don't work. And you, you see the deep confrontation with self when someone cannot admit to themselves something is not going to work. But on the other hand, you do have to persevere. So understanding or being able to guess which plans are worth sticking with and which ones require a strategic uh, you know, deviation or pivoting is like, Dude, it's impossible. It's like, I, I think I think it's almost like um, all of the great adventure stories like Star Wars and The Matrix mm. and all of that are about learning to balance both skill and intuition, mm. which is the exact same thing. Skill will only get you so far without intuition and intuition without skill is you're going to become like, I've heard people say you become like a stupid saint. <laughs> that's a that's a great saying and it makes perfect sense. I also wonder about that album in particular. What is the process? And I guess I more mean the mental process of writing an album that's designed to resonate with kids on their level. And I guess to take it a step further, an album that is depending on their age depending on where they live, you may be writing about a topic that inherently has a stigma about it. And so you're not only trying to reach them at their level, but you may be trying to open their mind to something that 
they already have a negative association with for whatever reason. Yeah. I mean, I, I think to be entirely honest, I, I'm not someone who is particularly good at making work for kids. Um, there are other artists, they might be giants, at least a lobe, you know, there are, there are artists who have been successful at that. I'm not one of them at this point in my career. What I do, you know, I'm working, I've been working the last decade with Tom Robbins on this musical Beers for Beer. And part of what attracted me to it is on the front of the book, he said, a children's book for grown ups, a grown up book for children. That's, that's the work I make. I'm not actually singing to kids. I'm singing to the kid inside the grown up. Mm hmm. Mm-hmm. And I don't think that record about Islam was listened to by that many kids. I think there were some, but I actually think it was listened to by grown-ups who understood the value of it and it, it connected them to something in themselves. Because I think we all, that's bringing it back to Jonathan Richman, like probably my favorite songwriter. That's what I learned from him that, and the violin femmes too. It's like, it's like we all have a kid in us and singing to that kid. It, it needs music, but it needs music that acknowledges the complexity of the adult world. I think, you know, like probably my bigger songs, like Catch My Disease and Rolling This Together, were songs that, yes, kids enjoyed. But when I looked out at my audience, there would only be a handful of kids there, mm-hmm. but there would be grown ups acting like children. <laughs> Well, I think we've come full circle and I know that you need to go and, uh, um, yeah, yeah, go. Go. yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> I want to thank you so much for, for your time. I mean, obviously you didn't, you didn't have to, to do this and it really means a lot to us. It was a, a wonderful conversation. Oh, we got to talk about interesting things. Best of luck to Kate. Cheers. Okay. Yeah, we'll do. Okay. Bye. <laughs> This is the part of the episode, Mark, where we usually do a recurring segment, Mm -hmm. like uh, confessions, like... uh, Love that one. What are the other ones? Did I just say that out loud? So that's a thing now. This, I want to use the next few minutes for something a little bit different today, because you have been working on a creative side project that we haven't talked about yet. You... I've been working the, a link into the show notes. I've noticed that. But we haven't talked about it. We and have, I, I thought this could be a good opportunity for you to introduce your project to our listeners. That's very that's very kind of you. Um, I didn't expect that. This is a safe spot to be vulnerable. Okay. I, um... <sighs> Suspense is building. Yeah, I, uh, I started a band. Uh... It's a one man band and we're called stuffed animal. (laughs) So here's, uh, here's the elevator pitch for stuffed animal. Okay. It's rock music for kids. Okay. And that's it. That's the whole, that's the whole elevator pitch. Short and sweet. I like it. See, I, I grew up loving bands like Weezer and green day and Nirvana presidents uh, Fountains of Wayne, Classics. that kind of stuff, like mostly harmless, punky, poppy rock music. And that uh, that type of music means a lot to me. And so naturally, when my kids started getting a little bit older, I really wanted to share that kind of music with them. Of course. And so somewhat simultaneously, after my kids were born, like I found myself writing tons of silly little nonsense songs for them, <laughs> like just on my acoustic guitar. Mm-hmm. Um, and one day I just kind of thought like, what if I wrote songs like that, but in that style of music that I love so much. And so stuffed animal was born on the website. I say, I write music that I love for the kids that I love, but you can listen to, (laughs) I try to involve them as much as they'll tolerate it by asking them to give me lyrics and stuff like that. So yeah, yeah. Songs like gold van is 70% lyrics from a two and a half year old. But all the songs are about things like matchbox cars or our dog or the alphabet, Mm -hmm. things that they know about and love. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, It's you playing all the instruments. Yeah. It's yeah. It's me playing guitar, uh, bass, singing, creating the drum tracks, 
Um, there's even like some synth and keyboards once in a while. Um, and I, I plan to try to get the kids more involved as time goes on, like maybe with singing or something like that. Yeah. Super fun. I, I love everything that you've sent me. Uh, uh, give us a couple of the song titles. Oh, right. Yes. Uh, well, there's the aforementioned gold van. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. There's one called new toy, which you haven't, I don't believe you've heard that one yet. I have not. It's a good one. I need to re-record parts of that one. Um, there's police car. Love that tune. Oh, and actually, uh, I ha- actually, I have plans to write a song for every letter of the alphabet. Dude, that is might a, be, I might be biting off more than I can chew. Yeah. That's an undertaking, but man. I already have letter a, I've got uh ode to W I've got O parentheses more than a letter. Um, H <laughs> is a good friend. Uh, and that one is, that one's written from the perspective of the letter G. Oh, so cover two bases with maybe that. sort of a forbidden love kind of story. I don't know. You'll have to listen to it. <laughs> right, right, right. Uh, you just sent me one, I think this morning that I actually haven't listened to yet about a sandwich. Yeah. Yeah. PB, PB and J parentheses. There is nothing better because, mm. you know, I don't know, maybe, maybe that's the perfect sandwich. <laughs> I don't know. Damn straight. You know, that's what the song explores. Should we hear just a few seconds of that? Sure. <laughs> We can hear a couple seconds of that. <laughs> if you want to use all money, but that's cool. We got chunky or smooth. And there's a great abundance of jelly flavor like grape Great. and strawberry too. Strawberry. Now slather it all together to make something good. Let's make a got the it's got the hook of every great like 90s tune you know it that song belongs as the theme song to a friend's spinoff or something oh oh wow i feel like that's really that's really high praise i appreciate you it's like it's like a dog's eye view or oh man um, yeah you know gin blossoms maybe dishwalla yeah something (laughs) like that one of those one of those like bands that can't really they're just they can't exist in another era like they're they had a great some great albums maybe one or two great albums but like you're that's it you're done well i'm totally loving it i'm super psyched for you it's so much fun please keep sending me stuff as soon as you have it done and we'll play another tune you know to close out the show uh, but let people know where they can find stuffed animal music oh right yes of course um please go to stuffed animal music.com and, uh, you know, go to soundcloud.com slash stuffed animal music and you'll you'll find uh, some tracks there as well. I see you're shaking there, lying on the floor. Nervous dog, nervous dog. Teeth chattering, what's the worry for? Nervous dog, nervous dog. There well, that concludes another episode. I love when this announcer thing comes out. It seems so inauthentic. I can't can't not at all. It's not. It never comes. I know it doesn't. I mean it. I mean it. Here's the thing. Even though I sound like I don't mean it, I mean it. You know, I know. Uh, Anyway, that concludes another episode of the podcast. Go out there on the Internet. Find us at moderndadhood.com or Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, Spotify, Amazon Podcasts. What, excuse me, let me try that again. <clears throat> Amazon Podcasts. <laughs> There's a few others, right? There Any come to mind? There are many. Uh, it doesn't matter. No. It doesn't matter. <laughs> Wherever you listen to your podcasts, you'll find us. Do us a favor. Please subscribe. Why don't you give us a, a little rating? Maybe tell a friend. Maybe leave us a review. My God, these things would be amazing. The best way for us to get Modern Dadhood in front of other people is for them to hear it directly from you. How much... You love the show. So thanks for helping us to spread the word. You could also follow us on Instagram. We have a Facebook page account. I don't know what to call it. I'm old. Um, We have a YouTube channel. I I think you can just simplify it by saying, find us on all the socials, right? (laughs) 
We want to send huge thanks as always to Casper Baby Pants and to Spencer Alby for the music that you hear in Modern Dadhood in in this episode, uh, music from Stuffed Animal as well, right? Oh yeah. Thank you to Pete Morse at Red Vault Audio. You can check him out at redvaultaudio.com. Pete's responsible for making us sound as good as we do, considering we're recording in different places still. Oh, also, hey, thank you, thank you once again to Ben Lee for taking a little bit of time and uh, sitting down chatting with us. Yep, uh, that was honestly such a treat. And last but not least, uh, thank you for listening. 